things that I probably forgot while, I, while we were gone. I'm just trying to figure out if I can work this thing again. So, you know, just stuff like that. Uh, you don't lose it, you use it, right? Or don't use it, you lose it. Or something. Uh, all kinds of stuff like that. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 11 this week. If you would like to, please stand with me and honor the reading of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you, will, if you fall down and worship me. 
Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him. Behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for this precious passage of Scripture. We thank you for the fact that it's been preserved for us and we learn from it so often. We thank you for the power of your word. And we know that uh, we are the church because of the power of your word that the gates of hell will not stand against us. And so we, th we, we thank you, Father, for this marvelous example that applies to us even today. That we handle temptation by responding to it with Scripture. And so we just ask, Father, as we, as we dive into your word, we just pray, Lord, that, that you'll be honored, that you'll be glorified. We lift all this up to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In 1988, Hollywood released a blasphemous film called The Last Temptation of Christ. It was directed by Martin Scorsese, which is the name some of you would know. It was an adaptation of a controversial 1955 novel of the same name. The book and the film depict Christ being tempted by imagining himself engaged in sexual activities, which caused, as you can imagine, some outrage from some Christians. My only objection to that thought is that it should have been met with outrage from all Christians. It received positive reviews from Christians and some religious, religious leaders, and Scorsese received a nomination for the Academy Award for Best Director. Barbara Hershey, if you know her, Barbara Hershey's performance as Mary Magdalene earned her as a, a, a nomination for the Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actress. In the film, Jesus is torn between his own desires and his knowledge of God's plan for him. His friend, Judas Iscariot, is sent to kill him for collaborating with the Romans to crucify Jewish rebels, but suspects that Jesus is the Messiah and asks him to lead a war of liberation against the Romans. While Jesus assures Judas that the gospel is about love for mankind, Judas warns, warns him not to harm the rebellion. And Jesus goes into the desert to test his connection to God where he resists temptation by Satan. Returning from the desert, Jesus is nursed back to health by Mary and, and Martha of Bethany, who encourage him to marry and to have children. There are plenty of similarities to the Gospels, just enough to make an uninformed person persuaded that this was entirely true. There are some obvious exceptions. <laughs> Let me just go through a few of them for you here. While on the cross, a young lady who claims to be Jesus' guardian tells him that while he is the Son of God, he is not the Messiah. And that God is pleased with him and wants him to be happy. She brings him down off the cross. And while she's invisible to others, she takes him to Mary Magdalene, whom he marries. They live a happy life, but when she abruptly dies, Jesus is consoled by his angel and goes on to start a family with Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. You get that? Started a family with Mary and Martha. Then as an older man, Jesus encounters the Apostle Paul preaching about the Messiah and tries to tell him that he is the man about whom Paul has been preaching. Paul rebuts him saying that even if Jesus had not died on the cross, his message was the truth. And then nothing would stop him from proclaiming that. Now Jesus debates Paul. Just let that sink into your brain for a second. Stating that salvation cannot be founded on lies. And near the end of his life with Jerusalem in the throes of rebellion, an elderly dying Jesus calls his former disciples to his bed. When Judas comes, he reveals that Jesus' guardian angel is actually Satan who tricked him into believing that he did not have to give himself up to save the world. 
Crawling back through the burning city, Jesus reaches the site of the crucifixion and begs God to let him fulfill his purpose, stating, I want to be the Messiah. Jesus finds himself once more on the cross, having overcome that, the last temptation then of escaping <coughs> death. Being married, having a family, and the ensuing disaster that would have consequently encompassed mankind. Jesus cries out, it is accomplished, and dies. Now, I had to look all this up. I hope you understand. We didn't go see this piece of trash, and I hope nobody in the room here did either. Um, but I want, what I want us to look at this morning is that as we look at the truth of the gospel accounts of the temptations that the historical Jesus endured is that one, they are unique to him. And two, they provide us with a pattern by which we should combat temptation in our lives as different as it is from His. Now, before we jump into the text, I want us to see, set things up for you just a little bit, just to prepare to understand the importance of this passage. Both Mark and Luke also record the, these events. And Paul uses the word temptation or tempted seven times to encourage believers to avoid it, and Peter uses it once himself. So this is, this is a concept that, is, that runs throughout Scripture. However, the writer to the Hebrews, who was neither, by the way, neither Peter nor Paul, offers a great starting point for us. Hebrews 2.18, if you want to jot that down. Hebrews 2.18, For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered... He is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And when we hear the word temptation, our minds generally race to something bad because we use, we use it incorrectly. Temptation in and of itself is not sinful. It's simply the result of being human and having to deal with a sin nature. If we weren't tempted, it could only be because we were so wretched that we were incapable of shame. And yet many of us suffer from temptations that we should never have to endure only because we refuse to allow the Lord to move us to a higher level where the temptations would take on different forms. We have to understand that my inner spiritual nature determines what causes me to be tempted. The temptation fits my inner nation inner nature and it demonstrates the possibilities of my nature. Now, don't see our confusion that is quite so obvious here. It actually does confuse us for a while and we're not sure whether something is right or wrong. But when I yield to it, however, I've made some type of lust don't, don't necessarily tie that to sex. But I've made some type of lust my God, and that's with a little g, and the temptation itself becomes the proof that the only thing that kept me from falling into sin any earlier was my own fear. Now, one final thought about temptation that deals with our temptation to prepare us for this text. Satan doesn't tempt us just to make us do things that are wrong. You with me on this? Satan doesn't just tempt us so that he can make us sin. Satan tempts us to make us lose what God has, has put into us through the regeneration or the salvation process, which is the possibility of being valuable to God. Now, follow that thought and, and kind of run it out a little bit before we go further. Because this is a great way to lose your witness. How you respond to temptation, when it comes, if we resist it, then you've, 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 you've increased, you've empowered your witness. If you fail, you've damaged your witness. Because, listen, there are people who are out there who are just waiting for you to stumble. You've, spread, you, you've shared the gospel with people, and people say, oh, you know, uh, she thinks she's pretty, she's pretty spiritual. As soon as she stubs her toe, then guess what? Ah, well, see, I told you this, this Christianity was, was nonsense anyway. 
They're just waiting for us. So temptation becomes an important, and how we handle it then can determine whether, whether our witness receives damage or whether it grows. In other words, we're not tempted just to make us sin, but to make us lose our point of view. And only the Holy Spirit, listen, only the Holy Spirit can discern whether this, this temptation is from the evil one or not. Hebrews, again, Hebrews 4, 15, and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Did you get that? Yet without sin. Not at all like that, that garbage movie that I was just talking about. Yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And in fact, you're quite aware that Jesus' model prayer, which we'll see in chapter 6, includes the request not to be led into temptation. That may make more sense to us when we can put it into the context that he had already been tempted and he had rejected every temptation. Let's look at verse 1. We'll see the Spirit initiated. Spirit initiated. Verse 1 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, one thing to keep in mind as we work through this is there are no other witnesses to this event. The only way that we had this preserved for us in Scripture is that Jesus had to tell some or a few of his disciples exactly what happened. Since it's been a while since we looked at the baptism of Jesus, if you remember about three weeks ago when we went through chapter 3, I'm going to point out to you that the common factor here is the Holy Spirit. So we saw in chapter 3 the Spirit sent Jesus to be baptized, and here the Spirit led him into the wilderness. Now, Neither of these events make sense to us outside of preparing Jesus for his earthly ministry by emphasizing his role as Messiah. You can't imagine, so you're kind of thinking about this. What would be the strategy of the Holy Spirit taking Jesus to be tempted? The way you and I think today with the Western mind, that just doesn't work. But it works perfectly from God's perspective. He's going to get him ready. He's a man. He's fully God. He's fully man. Now, in Greek, the word, therefore, devil means accuser or slanderer, you'll see in some places. And on a side note, side note when, when Scripture uses the term malicious gossip, it does pop up in Scripture a couple of times in the New Testament, it's this word for devil. So, it's from the same family words. Keep in mind the next time you hear malicious gossip, whether it, obviously it comes from somebody else's mouth and not yours, right? <laughs> next time you hear somebody else maliciously gossiping, whoever is doing the talking is being demonic. Kind of makes that a little bit more serious, doesn't it? And also, please notice that the wilderness in that part of the world, we talked about this a few weeks ago, was desert. And when I think of wilderness, I think of forest, and thick, thick forests and all this kind of stuff. This, and, and for, for them, it was a desert. We can, uh, you can still understand, this is a lonely place, whether it's the woods or whether it's a desert, right? In this case, it was a desert. It's lonely because nobody goes there accidentally. It's not on the way to any place. Spirit leads Jesus into an area where he has no human support system. Nobody else there to support him. Nobody else there to encourage him. I'll also let you know that in Greek, the word therefore to be tempted carries with it a, a, a notion of continuous action. So this wasn't something that was just uh, this. I mean, we read this, those 11 verses in just, a, you know, a minute or two, right? This is going to take a long period of time. Let him up there to be tempted. This is continuous action with it. And now the word tempted literally translates a test or, if you will, an experiment to prove something. Literally the way it shakes out is like, like say you've got, um, 
you've got something and you want you need to you've got some metal for instance and you want to burn it and so the impurities come to the top and so that you can you take those off and so that way what's left is pure right you've heard that this is how metal workers work right so that's what this word refers to it, it, it takes the impurities out that's the purpose of it to test this is not just to see if Jesus is ready. You have to understand that. This is not to see if he's ready. It, it's to prove he's ready. But Satan wants Jesus to declare his kingship prematurely and, and to snatch the messianic power for his own selfish needs rather than for the kingdom of God. I mean, just think about it for a second. If Jesus had failed in these temptations, then God's plan of salvation would have failed. Are y'all with me on this? This is why it's important. Messiah had to be sinless in order for him to become sin on our behalf. In John's first letter, which we studied last year, the devil's temptations center on three major areas. So if you want to jot this down, 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... Now, let me just give you a little parenthetical here. This refers to physical wants and needs. The lust of the flesh. And then John continues. And the lust of the eyes, that's possessions and power. And then the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. Did you all get that? God sends us. We, we, years ago, when we... When we first got here, we studied the book of James, right? God sends us tests. Temptations come from Satan. This is a big difference. Remember, nobody can ever demonstrate true obedience. This is very important. Nobody can ever demonstrate, demonstrate true obedience unless he or she has the opportunity to disobey. Does that make sense? In Deuteronomy, listen, God led the Israelites into the wilderness to see whether His people would obey. <laughs> they failed miserably. Our convictions are only real as long as they hold up under pressure. Let's look at verse 2. We'll see Jesus prepared. Jesus prepared. And after He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, He then became hungry. I don't know about you, I would have been hungry before 40 days. It doesn't give us any details about the fast, but he's gone without food for 40 days. Now listen, I've got pastor friends who've done this. And I want you to tell you that I basically just tip my cap to them. And anytime they challenge me to do it, I say, go on with your bad self. <laughs> I've, I've never made it past eight days, and then when, when Gail and I went through that, we, we, we still had this beverage that had some uh, lemonade and some syrup in it or something like that. No, no solid food. I've only made it three days without, with, with just water. And so 40 is a huge number. But it, it, it just shows us how stretched the Lord had to be before he faced the challenges. So that sets that sets up the, the temptations. So I mean, this is the, this is the preparation that's involved in this. A forty day fast. I don't know about you. I have trouble going forty minutes without food. Forty days. Now the number forty is going to remind the Jews about some past past unfaithfulness to God. It would remind them about the flood. It would remind them of the forty years of. of Israel wandering through the, the wilderness that I just alluded to. It would have reminded us of, of Goliath, would have reminded them of Goliath's taunting of Israel before David's victory. It would have reminded them of Elijah's fear in the wilderness. The number 40 is big in the Old Testament. They, these people were not walking with God, but God was preparing them for special tasks. And yet it's simply not abstaining from food. 
I mean, that's how it sort of manifests itself, but it's more to it than that. It's also to be accompanied by an, an intense time of prayer. It's to develop your spiritual relationship with God. Just if you do it occasionally, it, just if you do it intermittently or something like that, if you accompany it with prayer, the idea behind it is you think of all the time that you spend in preparation and in eating and all these other kinds of things like that, and if you devote that to prayer, then all of a sudden your prayer life gets multiplied, does it not? Something as simple as that. Jesus is obviously God in the flesh. But that flesh becomes important here because it connects him with us. I would imagine that once you think about how hungry you are, then you realize the challenge of staying connected with God. Jesus had been physically weakened. But what you have to see here, he would never be shaken spiritually. Notice quickly here, just as the Holy Spirit led Jesus to this experiment, we need to begin our day seeking that same Holy Spirit. As I said, our temptations are nothing compared to His. We need to be prepared for them daily with prayer and Scripture study. Now let's look at verses 3 and 4 and we'll see the temptation for food. Temptation for food. Verse 3 says, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones could become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now see, this first word from Satan here is the conditional if. Because Satan's greatest weapon is to create doubt. He knew Jesus was God's son, and Jesus knew Jesus was God's son. But that didn't stop Satan from starting with the word if. He's always questioning. He's wanting to plant doubt. And as, as some of you know, as we study the book of Ephesians in the pastor's class, what we're going to get to eventually is in chapter 5, we'll see that the, the, one of the armor pieces of the Christian is the helmet of salvation. Chapter 6, I believe, rather than 5. The helmet of salvation. And one of the crushing things that Satan wants to do is to smash the believer in the head with doubt. And it is the helmet of the hope of salvation that, that prevents that doubt. And that's, I'm borrowing Paul's words there as he wrote to the Thessalonians. The helmet of the hope of salvation. In other words, the confidence that our salvation is secure is a, listen, constant satanic attack. <laughs> this temptation is based on his physical need. But the temptation is not simply to make bread so that he can eat. You have to see past that. Satan's temptation might have been worded like this. Why should you starve in the wilderness when you have the power to turn the stones into bread? After all, if you're starting your ministry here, then your physical needs must be met. Satan was saying, I mean, it almost hurts me to say this, but this is playing Satan here. God is not holding up His end of the bargain. There's a suggestion from Satan for Jesus to sweep aside every human want by a divine act. It was also a temptation to really exercise personal selfish authority to do what would satisfy his own wants because he believed that God had let him down. Now this may sound familiar to you. The real last temptation of, of, of Jesus was to get off the cross. And if you remember, the other thief taunted him about this. It may also sound familiar in that the, the first Adam blew it with food, right? Satan wanted the last Adam to blow it with another food issue, this time bread. The temptation was far beyond that. The temptation, the point of Satan was this. He wanted to make Jesus doubt the Father's care. He wanted to destroy the Son's confidence in the Father. So let me rearrange things just a little bit to show us where our priorities should be. Our governing life principle 
should always be to operate in the will of God and then to trust Him for the benefits. Now, if that may sound familiar to you, Scripture says it like this, Matthew 6.33, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And we'll see more of this when we get into the Sermon on the Mount in a few weeks, Lord willing. But he'll teach us about not worrying about stuff because God will take care of us. Since he takes care of the birds and he takes care of the lilies and he takes care of the grass. And yet we still worry about stuff. Never blow past a true principle of righteousness to get something that you think that you want. Let me back up and go back over that again. Never blow past a true principle of righteousness just so that you can get something that you think huh, you want. Because your flesh is telling you that this is good. Your flesh is telling you that that is good. But in order to get this or that, what you have to do is get into a situation that it's not righteous. This might be, this is a temptation for me. But in the process, it's going to ruin my witness. Never let that get in the way. Never, never succumb to something that would, that would sacrifice or compromise righteousness. Just for something that, for a brief point in time, for a brief season of time, you might enjoy physically. When, when all that happens, you've just disobeyed the one true God. If you succumb to temptation like this, you've disobeyed the one true God who grants you any and existence at all. The fact that you and I breathe, we owe to God. Amen? Amen. Now let's look at verses 5 through 7. We'll see the temptation for faith. <clears throat> temptation for faith. Verse 5 says, Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Man. So having heard Jesus use Scripture to negate the temptation, Satan swings again. Now, suddenly, Satan thinks, okay, he's playing this game with me and he's quoting scripture, so guess what? I'm going to quote some scripture. I don't know about you, but I kind of am glad to see the fact that Satan pulls this thing way out of context and totally misuses it. You can pick up a lot of books today and find scripture in it. You can find a lot of cult material that has scripture in it. It's not in its context. It's, it's not the way that God intended for it to be. So here, the prince of the earth, the great liar, him, Satan himself, decides, okay, so we need a little strategy here, so I'm going to throw some scripture back at him. And he ends up with the egg on his face. He's subtly trying to misuse scripture here. He's trying to make his point. But again, we have to imagine that had, had Jesus taken that particular plunge that Satan is, is tempting him to do, then he never would have made it to the cross. And if he had never made it to the cross, then what? You and I are headed to hell. In fact, over the centuries, this you'll get a kick out of this. It's, it, it's sad. History has recorded that there are several people, not just a few, several people who have claimed to be the Messiah, who walk literally in these footsteps, and they go up into the highest point in Jerusalem that they can find, and they say, okay, since I am the Messiah, I am going to jump off of this building. And they jump. And they've never been heard of from since. <laughs> they get tempted to do a one and a half back gainer from a pike position. Splat. Dead. 
false Messiah. Can you imagine that? Being that he, he, the people who claim to be the Messiah work through this material and somehow figure, but since I am the Messiah, I can do this. When the real Messiah responds to the tempter with Scripture in the appropriate way. Oh, let's get back to Satan. I thought I'd never ever hear those words come out of my mouth, right? By the way, Satan is quoting Psalm 91, 1 through 12 here. But again, the purpose is clearly to establish it to kind of create some doubt. Apparently, Satan wants Jesus to prove the point. Which would have been simple, right? Can't do that. Now, we don't know exactly where this pinnacle is, but most people feel it could be from the royal portico in Herod's great temple in the Kidron Valley. Now, don't get your maps out. I'm trying to figure out where exactly this is. But let me just tell you this. If that's where it is, and a lot of people think that's where it is, it's a 450-foot drop. Now, we, we build skyscrapers today that, that double that. But it's a 450-foot drop, and somehow he was trying to tempt Jesus to just parachute without a parachute. No problems. I mean, if you're stupid enough, and, and, and Satan is... You know, Satan is, is 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 wise in different ways. He's he's a he's shrewd in different ways. Now, again, we don't know how how they got there. Scripture doesn't tell us if you know exactly how they got there, but they did. And Satan is going to tempt Jesus here by asking. The point is, how much do you believe that God is going to take care of you? That's the temptation. If you really believe that God's going to take care of you, do a backflip right here. Well, you can imagine the thought process. Well, I really believe that God's going to take care of me, but I'm not going to jump because that would be putting God to the test. That would cause me to violate Scripture. It's almost like Satan said, if you won't prove your Messiahship by working a miracle to save yourself, then why don't you let God prove that you're the Messiah by doing a miracle on His own? If God's the one that you're concerned about, let Him do it. Now, see, logically, this is a pretty good move on Satan's part. It's, it's a strong appeal. Let God do it. But notice that Jesus does not cast His pearls before swine. There's no debate here with the devil. Satan's second option is, is, is worse than the first, which was presuming on God. In the first temptation, a danger existed. In the second one, you create that danger. There's a difference. Jesus here is quoting Deuteronomy 6.16 about putting God to the test. You're not to tempt God with your own plans. Faith which depends on, listen, signs and sensations is not faith at all. It's doubt looking for proof. If faith can't believe without sensation, it's not faith at all. Jesus refused the way of sensation, for it was the people's way, and it was the way to failure. There's no sense in testing God because there's nothing to prove. He had already proven Himself. He's revealed Himself both in Scripture and in nature. Let's look in verse 8. We'll see the temptation for fame. The temptation for fame. Verse 8 says, Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. <coughs> so having two strikes, the devil offers one final desperate swing from the heels to achieve his goal. In the third temptation, the devil's ultimate goal and his absolute 
on his absolute ugliness become evident. He finally says, what I really want is for you to worship me. Because that's always been Satan's bottom line. That's always been how he operated. That's why he was kicked out of heaven to begin with. He couldn't stand playing second fiddle to the Trinity. He wanted to be like God. He couldn't stand just being an angel. We don't know what they saw. We don't know if they saw Egypt and its pyramids. We don't know if they saw the great sphinx. We, we, we don't know if they saw the, the buildings, the treasures. We don't know if they saw Greece. And, but he saw all the kingdoms of the world as they knew it at that point. All their splendor. Rome. Again, we don't know how God allowed him to be able to see all these kingdoms of the world, but they saw them. And Satan tries to convince Jesus that he deserved it all. But he asks again if God could be trusted. And with Satan, there's always a catch. Always a catch. God said, Psalm 2.8, Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. So this was a promise of the Father to the Son that he was to have. All these things... Would, would, were his already. But Satan says, compromise and get it my way, which is better. Even if he would have been entitled to it, it would have been bypassing the cross, which was just symbolized at his baptism. And as the prince of the air, Satan could have turned it all over to Jesus, but that would have required Jesus selling out to Satan. And instead of the long, bitter road to the throne, just one short bow. All you've got to do, Jesus, is bow down to me and you'll get all these things. Because you've been given to me and I'll give them to you. I just want you to worship me. It reminds us of what Satan told Eve. You shall be as God. And it might also remind you of Jesus. I'm sorry, of Judas who didn't want to be saved from his sin, but he wanted the spoils of being connected to the Messiah. Satan will tempt us, first, to doubt the providential care of God. And then he will tempt us to presume in a reckless appeal to God's care. And the Satan will also tempt you to fulfill your ambition, your way, for your benefit. You may remember the apostles James and John. They sent their mother to Jesus asking for one of her boys to sit on the right side of Jesus and the other on the left in the kingdom. It sounds preposterous to us as we've read Jesus' response, but it seemed like a natural request, did it not, from a loving mother at the time. Listen. The Lord's going to give them a place of rulership in the kingdom in His good time. They don't need to seek it out of personal ambition. So those are the three areas that Satan always attacks. First of all, doubting the providential care of God, then presuming on God by a reckless appeal to His existent grace, and then thirdly, temptation to use your ambition to fulfill the goals that God has already promised you, but on your terms. What that says, though, is, without using those words, you're not God, I am. Earlier I read to you Hebrews 15, Hebrews 4, 15. Let me, let me do it one more time. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Finally, let's look at verse 11. We'll see the victory over temptation. Victory over temptation. Verse 11 says, Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and began to minister to him. 
Satan had nothing left in his bag of tricks regarding argumentation. He tried the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. First he tried to get Jesus to doubt God and then to presume on God and then to take everything that a son could inherit, but do it on your own terms. And everything failed, but Jesus just summarily dismisses the defeated devil by what? Standing on the Word of God. He would not doubt God. He would not presume on God. He would not take all of God's good gifts in God's good time by God's good means and he would, listen, never compromise. It doesn't say he's defeated. You get that? It doesn't say he's defeated. He just leaves. He comes back later. He comes back again and again and again. He's defeated at the cross. And he's ultimately defeated, as we saw when we studied in Revelation, when he's sent to the final hell. The temptation failed, but the test succeeded. In the temptations, it was clear he was the perfect man. I don't know about you, when I read this passage, I get the thrill of victory. And you can imagine that Satan, as he's walking away here, experiences the agony of defeat. Although... That's, as I said a minute ago, that's not ultimately going to come until the end. Scripture doesn't tell us this either, but I can imagine the angels ministered to Jesus physically by bringing Him food and drink. Right? Forty days. And He has just survived this horrific temptation. So they bring Him food, I'm, I'm guessing, they bring Him food and drink but they're angels, right? And what's their primary purpose? They worshipped Him. He had just been tempted to worship Satan. And He puts that away. So the angels come, they feed Him. They worship Him. Wow. They, they could have also reinforced the fact that Jesus, He was an obedient Son in whom the Father was well pleased. Angels were there at His birth. They protected Him during His life. They were there at His resurrection. They'll be there at His second coming. And here, they're taking care of Him. They're ministering to Him physically and spiritually. Let me close here with just a few key thoughts from this passage. Watch for temptation at the high points of your spiritual life or when you just begin a new ministry either inside or outside the church it's in the exhilaration of those moments that Satan wants to knock you down to set you back to deter you no sooner was Jesus out of the water of the baptism than he was in the fire of the temptation as long as he was working with the carpenter's tools <laughs> Everything was fine. Satan didn't harass him. But once his ministry debuted, here comes Satan. We also need to be careful in times of weakness, in times when we're in evil surroundings. Jesus was in the wilderness. And he was weak. And Satan comes. We also need to guard our strengths. Where they're the things that Satan likes to push into sin. And then finally, we have to, as Jesus gave us a marvelous example, we have to know the Word. I mentioned a minute ago the armor of God, Ephesians 6. We talked about the helmet of salvation. The Word of God is the sword that goes along with the armor of God. And we face temptation every day. One little, one little illustration that I've read about this is they're, they're kind of like rocks in shallow water that get hidden by waves. But they're sitting ready to rip our boat into shreds. 
But as we focus on Jesus and we see how he used scripture to rebuff the temptation that was, that was delivered to him, and as we watch and as we pray and as we feed on the word of God, then God will provide the tide that covers the rocks that allows our ship to keep sailing. We focus in on him. We spend time in his word. You cannot defeat the temptation that Satan will bring you unless you understand Scripture and are ready to use it the way Jesus showed us to. Would you pray with me, please? Father, our hearts are full of victory and full of joy just reading this passage, but at the same time, Lord, it causes us concern of our need to deepen our relationship with you, to strengthen our resolve to be about your mission. We just pray, Father, that as we go through this, that you'll allow our command of your word to grow. And I pray, Father, that as we connect with the Holy Spirit, that He'll illuminate the Scripture to us so that we can use it in the offensive manner that it was, that it was intended as Your Word. We pray, Father, now for people who are listening to this over the Internet or people who are here in our sanctuary we ask, Father, that if it be your will, that you would draw people to you in a saving way. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark and Taylor are here. They're going to leave us in a couple of verses, a couple of stanzas of a hymn of invitation. If you need to do any business with the church, you need to do any business with the board, I'll be down front. While they play it as they sing, I invite you to come.